the hell is going on? What's really going on? We said, what the hell happened? You don't have to know what the hell is on it. They, they see what's going on. I don't know what's going on. What is going on? We must find out what is going on. Hi, I'm Danielle Petka. And I'm Mark Thiessen. Welcome to our podcast, What the Hell is Going On? I am having so much fun doing this podcast with you, Danny. This is this has been awesome. And we've got a bunch of great new guests coming in the next few episodes. We've got Congresswoman Liz Cheney uh, has agreed to join us. Uh, we're going to talk to her about uh, Syria and Afghanistan and what the way forward is there. We've got Ambassador Ron Dermer, the Israeli ambassador to the United States. And we've got General Keith Alexander, the former head of the National Security Agency, is going to be coming on uh, to, talk to talk about to us. cyber. To talk about the, the un, very unreported cyber war that's going on between the United States and Iran and in other places. So uh, lots of good stuff coming in the pipeline. But what are we talking about today? So today we're talking about what the hell is going on in Saudi Arabia. We saw over the weekend what was first reported as a drone attack on a Saudi oil facility near the Saudi-Yemeni border. As the news evolved, massive conflagration. The uh, Saudi oil output was cut in half. They've now brought a little bit back online. But what became clear is this was more than just a little drone attack from a bunch of ragtag rebels. This was, according to all the reporting, and we're seeing it out of ABC News, we're seeing it out of the Wall Street Journal. I think the administration has gone far and wide in talking about this. What this looks like is an attack that may well have happened or been staged from the Islamic Republic of Iran, even though the Yemeni Houthis, uh, the Shia group that now controls Yemen, uh, claim credit for it. Massive, massive damage in Saudi Arabia. Who the Houthis, Danny? Well, we're going to talk a little bit about who, to, who the Houthis are. Yep. Uh, this is a group that nobody, of course, uh, had heard of until... Actually, let me just say this right up front. Nobody had heard of the Houthis, and nobody in Washington or anywhere else gave a damn about Yemen mm-hmm. until the Saudis killed Jamal Khashoggi. Yeah. Okay. Let let us be frank. This was this was not even Syria in the minds of the international community. Yeah. Even though there was a conflict going on there, no one cared about it. Yeah. So Yemen is a is a country on the border of Saudi Arabia. There are the Houthi rebels who are the the Shia Iranian backed rebels. Uh, it's an, also a country where Al Qaeda in uh, the Arabian Peninsula, which is a Sunni terrorist movement that was uh, that is until recently the largest threat to the American homeland, they are operating there. So there's a lot of really important interests happening in Yemen that uh, that matter for us, for the security of the homeland, for our interests in the Middle East and our interests around the world. And this is a proxy war that's taking place between the United States and Iran, in effect, because Iran is funding and arming and training the Houthis just like they train and arm Hezbollah, just like they uh, do, they, they support Hamas, just like they support these, uh, the, these Shia militias in Iraq. This is another branch of their external war against the United States and its allies. And now they've take, carried out an attack against uh, Saudi oil facilities that seems to, that is almost demanding an American response to the Iranian homeland. Okay, and of course, our president, uh, never one to to back down on demands <laughs> such as this, has tweeted out a variety of things in response. Yes, uh, we are we are cocked and ready, and we're just waiting for the Saudis to tell us what to do. That was just one of the. Okay. No. I, I can't even call it one of the dumber things he said, but well, it was a ridiculous I'm, thing to say. Well, I'm glad the cocked and ready part doesn't bother me at all um, because this this does require a response. We don't know exactly what the proper response is yet. I mean, it might be it might be a military kinetic strike. It might be, quite frankly, what we're going to talk about with General Alexander in an in a, in a upcoming episode, which is a cyber uh, response might be the appropriate one, which are actually quite devastating. But what's what's what I want to get into is what what was. Iran thinking, and whether whether it was the Houthis who did it or the Iranians directly uh, from their territory, 
this was a very provocative action. What do you think they were thinking to carry out an attack like this? So, so, so especially if it came from Iranian territory on Saudi territory. I yeah, mean, that's it. That part seems. That, I mean, that part seems kind of crazy to me. But I will say this. You know, we, you and I had this conversation when we had Fred Kagan on uh, a couple months ago, and what we were talking about with Fred was the attack on a couple of oil tankers yep. in the Persian Gulf, the Arabian Gulf, whatever we want to call it, and. At that point, there were questions about whether the Iranians were responsible for those attacks. Uh, the United States provided drone footage of boats that looked exactly like Iranian fast attack boats, and yet there was still some question in the minds of, of people. Fred said that the Iranians pursued this really effective Soviet-style strategy, which is to raise questions in the minds of people about whether they're responsible. Because basically... Because there's lots of people wishing they weren't responsible so that they can make excuses for it because they don't want to uh, deal with the consequences of if they are responsible. That's exactly right. No, And, and I think that it, it's not just that. It's all wrapped up with, with Trump hatred. You know, the, in, in each case, the Trump administration has come out very, very quickly, more quickly than people are used to, and said, hey, you know, this guy said he was responsible. He isn't responsible. It's the Iranians. And people don't know whether to believe them or not because the administration is deemed so untrustworthy by many in the United States, particularly among reporters. So the question here, well, it's true. Yeah. So the question here is, you know, did the Iranians do this? Now, Fred said, you know, Fred said when we had that previous discussion, OK, let's see. Who could have done it? Well... It was a massive attack, possibly even beyond the strategic capabilities of the Houthis, who had an interest in doing this. Mm, did the Saudis do it to themselves as a false flag operation? That seems kind of fake. Yeah. Did the Israelis do it? Because they're often... Uh, no, Jews I don't are think responsible so. for everything. Yes, pretty much everything. <laughs> but I still think the Jews did, were not responsible for this. Yes. Uh, I think... It, no matter where it came from, the Iranians were responsible for this. Yeah. Then, you know, what do they get out of it? What do you think? Well, so this, I think what's going on here, and this gets to something that Fred was saying, which is that what the Iranian play right now is that, they, look, they are they are hurting from these sanctions that we've imposed on them. If you just look at, I mean, Fox News just reported on Friday that 17 of Iran's 18 pension funds are near collapse. Iran's oil exports have gone from 2.5 million barrels a day in April of 2018 to about 100,000 barrels a day right now, which is a 96% reduction. Uh, their budget, their, their federal budget is going to contract by 40% as a result of the oil sanctions. Pompeo said that they're literally, their, their GDP is going to go down between 12 and 14%. They are hurting badly from the maximum pressure campaign. They can't seem to find a way to get Trump to lift the maximum pressure. The only way they can do that is by getting the Europeans to pressure us to do it, as we saw the play they made with, with the French president at the G7 summit, right? And the, the problem is, is that they've recognized that uh, that Europe is more pliable to that kind of pressure because Europe is more dependent on Iranian and Middle Eastern oil than we are. Because because of the fracking revolution, we are not dependent on oil coming through the Straits of Hormuz, though it, it's a global oil market, and so therefore prices will be affected. But we're not we're not depending on that oil, and we also don't trade with Iran, whereas the Europeans do trade with Iran. So they are using the weakness, the the inherent weakness of the Europeans, <laughs> combined with their dependence on Iran and on Middle Eastern oil when Fred was talking about it to attack the the oil shipping, but now we've got an attack on on Saudi oil facilities. And of course, the goal is to get the Europeans to set their hair on fire and come to Trump saying, you've got to stop this maximum pressure campaign. You've got to, uh, you've got to ease up pressure because we could be headed towards a massive war in the Middle East. I mean, I think all of those are potential plays for the, for the Iranians. This is a win-win for them. You know, first of all, they're hurting for money. Every time oil prices go up, it's great news for them because if you're selling less oil, you want to at least get more money for it. Mm -hmm. That's number one. Number two, as you rightly said, they are trying to split the Gulf and the Europeans off from the Americans. Now, that's a little counterintuitive, I think, for, for people to, to think about. Huh. So why would an Iranian or an Iranian-backed attack on a major Saudi oil facility actually split the Saudis off from the Americans, the country whose president says, I'm waiting for you to tell me what to do. I've got your back. And the answer to that is this is a, this is a shrewd play. Look, as you rightly said, they're looking at 
their own territory, and they're thinking to themselves, hmm, this is escalating pretty darn quickly. And we may be engaged in a conflict not only, say, the Saudis in Yemen, but also to our north with the Iranians. Are the Americans going to be there for us? I got to say, let me ask you this. Do you think in the event of a conflict in the Gulf that, that we would necessarily actually be there in force for our friends? Oh, I think so. Do in, you? In, in, I in think a conflict with doubts. Iran? Yeah, I, I, th- think, I think with Iran. In, before yeah. an election, you think Donald Trump, who just canned his national security advisor for one reason, for, uh, for among other reasons, I should say, that he thought that he was trying to push towards war. Do you think that, that Donald Trump would get into a conflict with Iran in the Gulf a year before an election? Well, wouldn't it be ironic if uh, just after John <laughs> Bolton left office that the uh, U.S. went and attacked Iran? <laughs> yeah, but I mean, yeah. I, 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 mean I, I think yeah. they have doubts about him. And well, they're I, certainly and testing so him. They're, they're, they are certainly testing him. Um, look, Donald Trump is getting a lesson in the nature of our enemies. He invited the Taliban to Camp David, and they responded by carrying out a suicide attack that killed an American right on the eve of that Camp David summit. And he had to cancel it and canceled all the talks, at least for now, uh, with the Taliban. And now he wanted to talk to Iran's leader at Unga. He wanted to, he wanted to uh, get a big deal with them and get them to talk. And the Iranians responded with this. Uh, this is, you know, he's learning very quickly that not all ty- terrorists and tyrants are as desperate for a photo op with him as uh, Kim, Kim Jong-un, Jong-un. right? <laughs> okay, so you and I are having a good time. We could spend the entire next half an hour talking. But actually, to get the views of somebody who has been following this for a long time, who's been in Yemen, who's traveled with some of the forces who are uh, actually fighting with the Houthis, we've got Catherine Zimmerman. She is a resident fellow at at the American Enterprise Institute. She's been the lead al-Qaeda specialist at uh, AEI's Critical Threats Project um, and who follows this very closely. Thank you so much for being with us. All right, Katie, so we've got a lot of fast-breaking developments here. The Saudis have just said that the attack on their oil facilities was launched with Iranian weapons, and ABC News is reporting that U.S. officials have said that the that the attack came from the territory of Iran. Just start, start from me, what happened here? And how, how did we get to this point? What we know is that there was an attack on Saudi oil facilities that have shut down production in them, causing a massive surge in prices. The Houthis from Yemen claim the attack, but it's becoming more apparent that the Houthis were not behind this. And who are the Houthis, just quickly so people don't understand? The Houthis are a group that's received Iranian support inside of Yemen, and they are fighting on one side of the Yemeni civil war. Got it. All right. Katie, thanks so much for being here. So... I think a lot of this is really confusing to people. What's going on in Yemen? Who are the Houthis? Who are these people? And why is Saudi Arabia fighting with them? The Houthis are a minority opposition group that have taken control of Yemen. They executed a coup in September of 2014, claiming that the Yemeni government uh, didn't represent them and they took over the country. The challenges that we face are that the Houthis have received significant Iranian support. They're a proxy army. They're, right. So they've received uh, Iranian support both in terms of drones being moved in. Uh, the Iranians have moved the cap- capability to build bombs inside of Yemen, the ballistic missile attacks that the kingdom Saudi Arabia has suffered from over the years. All of that is imported from Iran into Yemen. And so the – but we – our understanding is that it was not the Houthis who carried out this attack, though they have launched attacks into Saudi Arabia in the past. So that seems like a good cover to blame the Houthis uh, for this attack. But the U.S. is saying that this actually came from Iran proper. What do you make of that? This is not the first time the Houthis have claimed to conduct a massive attack in Saudi Arabia that they weren't responsible for. Okay. When earlier, was the other time? Earlier this summer came out in June that the Houthis had claimed an attack that probably came from Iraq actually. And not, but not from the government of Iraq, right? It's right. from the... Shia it's, militias. From right. It's from Iranian the popular backed. mobilization units, these Iran-backed militias in Amazing. Iraq. It always seems to come back to the same source. Yeah. <laughs> Iranian militias in uh, in Iraq, Iranian militias in Yemen. Um, it's, it, there seems to be a pattern here, doesn't there? Definitely. It, wor- it works for the Iranians. Yep. They like their proxies. In the 
this is why the Iranians have invested what they have in the Houthis. It allows them to pressure Saudi Arabia from Saudi Arabia's southern border. So this is an Iranian play generally. So Iran has been waging war all across the Middle East using proxies. This is how they operate. Um, one of the developments that we've seen with the Trump administration has been that when when there were, was intelligence a, a few months back that they were that the Iranians were planning an attack on Americans in the region, they made a declaratory policy that we will hold Iran responsible for any Americans that are killed by their proxies. Are we sort of seeing a situation where the administration is having a policy of trying to remove that veneer or that fig leaf of the proxies and hold Iran directly responsible for the actions of its proxies? And is that a good thing? Iran has benefited from the plausible deni deniability of its yep. attack. So holding it responsible uh, should deter it. Um, and what we've seen in the past is that Iran has gotten away with attacks against American vessels in the Red Sea that the Houthis have fired. Um, and it was a response against the Houthis instead. The question is whether the administration will actually do what's necessary here to constrain Iranian action and whether we're willing to place the blame where it lies. OK, but the, wait, before we decide what's necessary, because that is, of course, <laughs> at least when we listen to the president of the United States, a question in all our minds, what's necessary and are we going to do it? Let's talk a little bit about the conflict between Saudi Arabia and Yemen, because this this war started in 2015. Um the Houthis weren't in charge then in Yemen. It was a Sunni government. And uh, this has been called the worst humanitarian disaster in the world. It has become such a cause celebre in the United States Congress that there were no less than five different amendments to the National Defense Authorization trying to stop all U.S. support, not just for operations in Yemen, but for any arms sales whatsoever to Saudi Arabia. So talk a little bit about this war. Who's right? Who's wrong? What's going on? The hard part about Yemen is that no one's in the right here. So the Houthis executed a coup and have taken over the country. They are behind egregious human rights violations in the areas that they control. The Yemeni government is barely there. It lives in Riyadh and is not actually perceived to be legitimate by many Yemenis. Uh, so the constituency don't like the people that are in charge. And when you start to walk down what's happening in Yemen, there's not somebody that the U.S. can point to and say, this is our phenomenal partner that we should back. And, you know, that, that goes... Nowhere in the Middle East where we can say no. this is our phenomenal no. partner who we should back. Um, and I think that Israel. The, the challenge that, that we're facing now is that there is a massive push against Saudi Arabia because it has committed war crimes inside of Yemen. That's that's very clear. And because it's easier to hold a state actor accountable for what it's been doing. So some of the points of power are the, the arms transfers, um, though... Stopping American sales to Saudi Arabia is not going to stop Saudi Arabia from acting inside of Yemen. Though this is a, I mean, this is not an unusual problem in American foreign policy, where you have, I mean, clearly in the broader scheme of things, the Houthis are a proxy force of the Iranians, so they are the bad guys, and then we have a ally in Saudi Arabia that, you know, I mean, we can go through the history of U.S. foreign policy where we have had allies uh, who are the good guys, but they don't act like good guys a lot and they do a lot of things that we wish they didn't. Um, but in the broader context, we, we don't want Iran and the Houthis to prevail, do we? No. And I think this is something that's been missed in the debate is the threat that the U.S. faces to its own interests now from Yemen. Um, it's not just Houthi attacks against Saudi Arabia, but it's Houthi attacks against the maritime traffic in the Red Sea and the one of the top maritime choke points in the world borders Yemen, which is why we even care about what's going on inside of the country. The Houthis have disrupted that. The threat that Iran poses now to the United States is not just in the Persian Gulf or even in Iraq or Syria or Lebanon, but it now can do something from the Arabian Peninsula, the Southern Arabian Peninsula on the Red Sea, and that starts to affect oil prices. Bombing in an oil field in Saudi Arabia will also affect oil prices. So why does Iran want to do this? Why would Iran carry out this attack, either directly or indirectly? Iran is looking to push the United States out of the region. We've been in a period of retrenchment since the Obama administration, and the Trump administration has not really reversed that despite talking about it. And attacking Saudi Arabia also puts pressure on the U.S. Gulf relationship. Uh, the Sa Saudi Arabia and the UAE have slightly different interests when it comes to pressuring Iran than the United States does, where the victims of conflict are going to be inside of Gulf countries, whereas the U.S., We'll feel it in the economy. We'll certainly feel it in American interests and with our dedication of resources, but it's not going to hit the homeland. 
we so, hope. Yeah. Well, but of course, Yemen was a place where bad guys did actually talk about hitting the homeland. I mean, we left aside in all of these discussions about Saudi Arabia and Mohammed bin Salman and what a bad guy he is and how awful Donald Trump is and how, what a humanitarian crisis Yemen is, is the fact that al-Qaeda and the Arabian Peninsula, which was, and I don't know whether we can say this anymore, you're the al-Qaeda expert, so tell us, but al-Qaeda and the Arabian Peninsula certainly was, after the death of Osama bin Laden, the most important branch of al-Qaeda. They were operating freely in southern Yemen and that was a problem for us. That's one of the reasons why we have supported some of the operations, not necessarily by the Saudis. Talk a little bit about that quickly. And to your point, Danny, al-Qaeda in Yemen is no longer what it used to be. And that's largely due to our partners, the Emiratis, who have been conducting counterterrorism operations on the ground. Now, talking about problematic partners, the way the Emiratis have done this is not the way that the U.S. would have done it. And so we've seen a series of, of allegations about human rights abuses and you know, the question of whether al-Qaeda is or is not defeated actually by, by the UAE. But when you look at it from a threat perspective, the Emiratis have eliminated almost all of the leadership that was running the organization. Those that remain are hiding out in caves in Yemen and are barely talking to their subordinates. And all of the intelligence threats coming from the U.S. intelligence community saying that this organization still has the intent, but it no longer has those same capabilities that it had in 2009, 10, 11, 12, when it was really threatening the United States. But we, as we know from the experience of al-Qaeda in Iraq slash ISIS, uh, who were down to 700 fighters uh, at the end of the surge when President Obama pulled out, uh, that can turn around really quickly. So it's, an, it's a fascinating situation that we have in Yemen because we have literally, you know, the, the war against terrorism has two faces, a Sunni face and a Shia face. And in Yemen, we seem to have both a Shia enemy and a Sunni enemy that we are fighting that both pose a threat to us and uh, that we need to, uh, we need to deal with. Certainly. And the, the real challenge is that we are not actually dealing with the underlying conflicts that are enabling both of them to thrive. And so this is one of the critiques of how the Emiratis have conducted counterterrorism operations. There's now been conflict in southern Yemen because some of the factions the Emiratis were working with are anti-government. Um, so there's political instability that's been driven and has moved into outright war uh, in, in Yemen South. And the Houthis have benefited from the fact that the grievances that they were voicing in 2011 during the Arab Spring and then 12, 13, and 14, which were not addressed, those still persist. And no one is talking about a resolution to those conflicts. Um, and until we do, I'm afraid that we're going to keep seeing these, uh, frankly, enemies of the U.S. Uh, thrive. So in each of these cases, we are seeing an attack on a Saudi uh, a Saudi oil field that has all sorts of ripples, including at, at gas stations in the United States where we're going to see the price go up. So here's the $64,000 question for all of us. What should the United States do? If you were sitting in the Oval Office advising the president, what would you tell him? No pressure. <laughs> no pressure whatsoever. Uh, the U.S. is already starting to do some of it. So in the past two months... Uh, Secretary of State Pompeo and Secretary of Defense Esper have been to the kingdom uh, to talk with others about, about Yemen, and there's been increasing engagement from the U.S. on the diplomatic side about how to resolve what's going on inside of Yemen, that sort of engagement. We haven't seen since the end of the Obama administration when Secretary Kerry threw, tried to Hail Mary pass at solving Yemen, which failed miserably. But the problem is we're not going to get a political resolution without changing the facts on the ground. And as they stand, the Houthis are going to have basically the, the, the state that they own uh, without significant military pressure. Our partners, Saudi Arabia and the UAE, the UAE has withdrawn. It's not involved in that part of the fight anymore. Saudi Arabia has not been capable and will not be capable of putting the military pressure on the Houthis. So we need to actually take a step back and say, how are we going to secure our interests? Um, it's not it's not going to be U.S. military, but it's not going to be our partners either. And the current policy is fundamentally flawed. Should we hold Iran responsible regardless of whether it was carried out from Iranian territory or via proxy? Yes. The Iranian responsibility and hand in this is very, very clear. And when you're looking at the Houthi-Iranian relationship, it's grown significantly since 2014 to the point now where Iran has supplied the Houthis with a threat capability that can extend all the way into Saudi Arabia, that 
even if the Saudis stopped bombing Yemen, that threat would remain from Yemen into Saudi Arabia, and there's no guarantee the Houthis will not use it in the future. I think that's one of the one of the challenges that the Saudis are facing is that they don't trust the Houthis not to attack them in the future. And we can't trust the Houthis, of course, as proxies of Iran, not to attack us or our partners and allies in the region. So short answer, Donald Trump, you got to do something. I don't know exactly what it is, but nothing should not be on the table. Katie, thank you so much for joining us. This is really, really helpful. Thanks, Katie. Thank you. All right. Well, that was a great interview with uh, with Katie. Dan- Danny, let me just throw this to you. What the hell do we do about this? We can't let this stand. There's got there's got to be a U.S. response. So what is it? No, that's that's the right question. But unfortunately, the problem the question isn't isn't a question about Saudi Arabia, and it's not a question about Yemen. This is a question about Iran. You know, we have over the last decades this. We can't blame Donald Trump for this. We can't blame Barack Obama. We can't even blame our favorite person to blame, George W. Bush. Not mine. Well, <laughs> well <laughs> our national favorite. Uh, uh, because this is about the growth of Iran's proxies. We have seen Iranian proxies transform from being minor terrorist groups, in the case of groups like Hezbollah, to being genuine armies with the kind of technology, the kind of uh, global positioning, Mm -hmm. the kind of precision-guided munitions, and now drones that we used to think of as being in the hands of sovereign nations. And they're everywhere. They're not just in Lebanon with Hezbollah. We saw Hezbollah fighting in Syria. We see Hamas, another Iranian proxy in the West Bank. We see uh, these these uh, popular mobilization units in Iraq, many, many of them that are Iranian proxies. Now we see the Houthis in Yemen. They're Iranian proxies. I just don't know how we can look at that and the growth of what in the old days we might have just called terrorist groups, Mm -hmm. all being run by Iran, and say to ourselves, this is okay. Yeah. Look, I mean, what people don't understand, we we don't call it the war on terror anymore, but whether we want to call it that or acknowledge it, the fact is the war on terror still exists. It's happening as a Sunni face, which is al-Qaeda and ISIS, and as a Shia face, which is Iran. Um, And we are at different levels at war with both of them, or at least they are at war with us. Uh, whether we want to be at war with them or not is uh, is uh, you know a question for uh, policymakers here. But you know the play f- from Iran, which is succeeding, is that everyone they want everyone to blame the maximum pressure campaign. They want to blame the U.S. for pro- we've provoked this, we've pushed them to the brink economically. Their economy is failing. They're spiraling in, into debt and 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 uh, inflation and unemployment. And they have to do something. So we've pushed them into this uh, untenable position. And it's Donald Trump's fault because of this ridiculous maximum pressure campaign. We had a deal with them. Uh, he pulled out of it. He caused all the instability. Obviously, I don't agree with this, but that's what the, what they're saying. Yeah. Um, and uh, and they're going to blame Trump and the pressure. The goal is to pressure us to lift the lift the pressure on them. That's right. And uh, if a different president is elected next year, they'll do that. Every single Democratic candidate has said that they're going to return to the the JCPOA, the Iran deal. So you know that. But I think that they need that pressure lifted sooner. The the issue here is that they want us to talk about Saudi Arabia. The Iranians are pointing at Saudi Arabia. The Yemenis are pointing at Saudi Arabia. Congress is pointing at Saudi Arabia. Everybody wants us to say, oh, it's because the Saudis are such bad guys. Well, okay, I'm willing to accept that the Saudis are bad guys. But in this instance, what we're looking at is state-sponsored terror. Mm -hmm. We're looking at the Iranians either directly or through the Houthis using that to attack the global oil supply to have a result that is a price boost for them, that is an attack on the Saudi the Saudi government. And I wish that I could be certain that there was more being done inside the government. I think that what Katie said to us is really important that what people fail to understand right now is that the Houthis have the whip hand. They are they govern Yemen. Right? They are in control of the government. They control most of the country. Certainly, the most important northern part of the country and near and the 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 passageways um, into Saudi Arabia for sure. Okay? They don't see any need to come to the table to negotiate. The only thing they could possibly be negotiating is handing over some of their power. What? Why, they, why should they do that? They they don't feel like they're under pressure. And of course, Congress. And the press and humanita- the humanitarian community are leaning on the Saudis in many ways 
totally rightly, to take that pressure off. So the, so the Houthis are basically giving the finger to everybody, including well, is, the United Nations. Is, well, a couple of things. One, this is the... Look, we keep hear, hearing from everybody, we don't want to be a war, you know, endless wars. We don't want to be involved in every war, you know, so let the Saudis fight their war. Well, when the Saudis fight their war, they fight it the Saudi way. You know, when we fight a war, we fight it our way. And with whatever whatever ethical constraints on the use of power that we have, the Saudis don't have those same constraints. So if you want to, if you, want to uh, you know, push out your war to other players, then you get, the, you get a different kind of war, number one. But two, this isn't really a Houthi, a Houthi play or a Houthi issue. This is an Iran issue. Um, this is about Iran, the, the Houthis are just a proxy for Iran, one of many proxies that they're using to wage war on the U.S. and its allies around the world. And, you know, the, the reality is people want to blame Donald Trump on the maximum pressure campaign. When Donald Trump came into office because of the JCPOA, because of the Iran deal part, and because of the, uh, the Obama administration's kowtowing to Tehran in the hope of, you know, while, while pushing away our allies, the Iranians were on the march across the entire Middle East in Syria and Lebanon and Iraq and Yemen. And because they had massive infusions of cash from the uh, sanctions relief and from the uh, and, uh, money that was sent on pallets, you know, in secret planes filled yeah. with euros and other, other currency. And they were using that to fund, the, to fund uh, the, the Hezbollah, the Houthis, uh, the Shia militias, and and Hamas, and the maximum pressure campaign has drained them of those resources and really hampered their ability to do that. So I know Donald Trump wants to use this to get them to the table, but the reality is, if even if we never get to the table, it's a good in and of itself because it means they have less money to carry out these uh, the, this, their aggression and their terrorism around the Middle East. Right, well, so well, so you, if nothing else happens, yeah. we've got to keep the maximum pressure campaign maximum. Yeah, okay, that's fair enough, and I, I'm, I'm not going to disagree with you about that. Um, I, I hope the president isn't, as some have reported over the, this last weekend, I hope that the president is not considering lessening sanctions in exchange for a meeting with the Iranians uh, at the United Nations. I agree with you entirely, but, 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 even with this little bit of money that they have. They can do a lot of damage. They can do a lot of damage, and they just have. And that, at the end of the day, is why we need to be leaning harder on the Houthis. It's why we actually do need to exact some sort of price for this attack in Saudi Arabia. But we Again, need a strategy that's more than just sanctions. I agree. And more, yeah. than, more than just sanctions and more than just tactical. Oh, you hit me, I'll hit you. You hit my friend, I'll hit you. Now, that does, that's, that's not right. We do need a strategy, and I think that we have lacked a strategy on Iran for a long time. We have no real end game. The president's end game of negotiations is a lousy end game. And for the rest of us who think negotiations are a lousy end game, we don't actually have one. Uh, you know, you and I have talked about this before. I'm not going to get into the whole Iran regime change thing. But bottom, bottom line is that while the Iranians have got us talking about Saudi Arabia and Yemen and provocations and the United States being too tough on everybody, the reality is they are the ones in Tehran who are calling the shots. We shouldn't be looking at Mohammed bin Salman. We shouldn't even be looking at the Houthis on this one. We should be looking at Tehran. And that's where we need to make clear this can't continue. And I think one of the things that the Trump administration has done as part of its maximum pressure campaign that is not a sanctions policy is that they have said they, they, may, they issued declaratory policy that any attack that kills an American, whether it's by Iran directly or by a proxy force, we will hold Tehran directly responsible and the consequences will be felt in Iran proper. I think that needs to be a broader policy. So do you um, think we should strike Iran? I think that it, it's a... Or do you think we should strike Iranian proxies? It, I don't know the answer to that. Um, that's that's a really fascinating question that we'll see played out in the next few weeks. There has to be a response, and it has to be a military response. It has to be a kinetic response. So one of the things um, I'm really looking forward to when we talk to the Israeli ambassador, Ron Derma, who's mm -hmm. very close to, to Bibi Netanyahu, is, first of all, to talk about their revelations about Iran's continued work yes. on the nuclear program, but also the fact that the Israelis not as quietly as they have historically have begun striking yes. Iranian assets in both Iraq and in Syria. Maybe, I don't want the Israelis to do our business for us because I think the United States should own what we do. I don't think we should work through proxies. If we, you know, that that's what got us into this problem in Yemen in some ways, this mm -hmm. work through proxies. But the um, Israelis are much better proxy than, well, than, than I, Saudi Arabia. True. But yes. But I agree with you. We need to, we need to hit something. Um, it may not I be Iran that, proper. 
Um, yep. They didn't hit us proper, so we they hit an ally. Maybe we hit their ally, um, and maybe we take maybe we launch an attack on uh, on Iranian forces in Syria, and that would be a proper response. One of your uh, colleagues just said that that was the right choice. And the other thing that they ought to do immediately, um, which plays down Donald Trump's hopes of a meeting, though I don't think he's going to he's even going to be pursuing a meeting, considering what just happened now. Uh, Liz Cheney said over the weekend on Meet the Press that we should deny visas to the entire Iranian delegation, including the Iranian president, to co- for coming to the UNGA. I don't think those people should be setting foot in the United States. That's pretty bold. <laughs> and of course, everybody will scream and jump up and down about the United Nations and the special diplomatic status. Well, but... you know, it's done so much for peace and security that uh, we don't want to undermine it. Uh, listen, uh, <laughs> watch this space. There's going to be a lot more happening. And God knows some of the things we've suggested may be overtaken by events while this podcast is, is, uh, is being produced. But There's a lot to talk about here. I just think one bottom line we've learned today is everybody says talk about Yemen. Everybody says talk about Saudi Arabia. Actually, we should be talking about Iran. Amen. Our team here at AEI is Alexa Santry, Matt Weinset, Jen Moretta, and Macy Heath. Let us know what topics you'd like us to cover. You can get in touch with the show by emailing us at whatthehell at AEI.org. Or you can reach us on Twitter. I'm at D. Pletka. And I'm at Mark Thiessen. That's Mark with a C. Please rate and review the podcast. If you like the show, please subscribe, share it, comment on Apple Podcasts, or wherever you're listening to this. Thanks for listening. Mm-hmm.